Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the pubcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Uh, we're very excited today to be broadcasting here from the World Dairy Expo. Last year, we, we were unfortunately not able to be here, and so we're ha very happy to be here live and in person. Speaking of live and in person, we typically do these remotely, and so our YouTube viewers will be used to seeing us all on little screens separately, but I'm happy to be here with some, uh, some icons of the industry uh, live and in person here today. My name is Scott Sorrell, and I'll be your host today. The three guests that we have here, we'll start off with uh, Jim Ostrom. Jim is a partner at Milk Source, and they have locations in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Missouri. I then have uh, uh, Pat Maddox here. He's the owner of Ruan Genetics and the Maddox Dairy in California. And over here to my left is Jonathan Lamb with uh, Oakfield Corners Dairy in New York. Uh, my co-host, he's currently, uh, we're recording this, um, between the Brown Swiss show and the Red and White show, and so he's got his last calendar ring. He'll be coming here in a little bit. Why don't we start with you, Jim? Give us a little bit of background on your dairy and uh, the show string. Uh, it's, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here at World Dairy Expo after missing a year. Um, I've been here every year since I was 16, and it broke my heart last year not to be here. Uh, Milk Source, uh, we're in Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, Missouri, Kansas, and we have a uh, large dairy farms but we also have a very boutique cheese business and uh, so it seems strange that a large dairyman is in uh, a small cheese business uh, but we felt that value-added branding would be best for us com to compete with uh, as opposed to commercial cheese where you're dealing with multinationals and and so that's kind of the, the nutshell of our business um, and it, again what a thrill to be at World Dairy Expo. Yeah, absolutely. I'll second that. Pat, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your business. Yes, our family has a diversified farming operation. Uh, 8,000 acres includes almonds and wine grapes and the dairy. And uh, we like to be diversified in our dairy as well. And one of those aspects is the showing, the show side. So but we sell semen, sell embryos, and we like to participate in the shows and be competitive. Yeah, excellent. I'm going to want to circle back on that genetic business here in a little bit. And over here to my lap, I feel like you're over there by yourself. You'll have Brian here in a moment, but uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background, Jonathan, on uh, you and, and your uh, operation. We actually have three uh, facilities where we milk cows in New York and one in Ohio. Uh, and like the other gentleman to my right, we have an aspect of our business that deals with genetics, both uh, show, showing dairy cattle and uh, producing bulls for AI. Okay, and what part of Ohio? I grew up in Ohio, so okay. I'm a little buff. Uh, <laughs> near Van Wert, Convoy, not oh, too sure, far from north. Fort Wade, Indiana. We're only a mile from the Indiana border. Yeah, excellent. I grew up in Preble County, Ohio, which is also on the, uh, the Indiana border, sure. just south of you. Excellent. Um, Jim, you talked to me uh, earlier today, and uh, we were talking about, I, I mentioned your, your, your hobby, and you said, no, it's not a hobby, it's a passion. It is. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that and how you got involved in uh, showing cattle? Well, I, I got involved showing cattle when I bought a heifer 15 years ago, and I couldn't stop. <laughs> and uh, we, we're showing 26 head this week in four different breeds. Uh, we have a, a very uh, specific facility in Kakana where we raise uh, 50 or 60 very, what we'd like to think are elite show cattle. Uh, it's a passion for us. We love cows. We spend our weekends and vacations go hopefully going to cow shows and, uh, and, and compete. It's, uh, the, my daughters one day asked me why, we, why I do it, and I, I said because... Uh, it, the, the first of all, the, these beautiful animals that have been bred for generations uh, for this purpose, uh, it just they're just stunning. And to go out at World Day Expo and see the caliber that's there, and then to be able to compete some days yeah. with the, the very elite, it's just a thrill. Yeah, awesome. So how have you been uh, doing so far this week? We're doing all right. We have a, a first, a second, a second, and uh, some heifers that are, uh, you know, three, three or four, fifth place. And... Uh, we're excited for a red show tomorrow and a black and white show, of course, on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Jonathan, what about you? How's the World Dairy Expo been going for you so far this week? Yeah, it's good. I, I, I concur. It's great to be back here. Uh, we really missed it uh, last year. The, the, dairy, the World Dairy Expo has kind of the pomp and circumstance and the excitement and the camaraderie with the other exhibitors that we're really looking for. 
Um, the aspect of our show program, my wife Alicia and I, it's kind of grown organically. We both grew up in 4-H and Junior Holstein, and after college, we both kind of wanted to dip our toe in, into it a little bit. And and um, like Jim, it just once you get one, you get a second, and then you, uh, you again organically, it just grows over the years and gets bigger and bigger till now, where we have our own our own barn where we keep those uh, special kinds of cows to get the care that they need uh, you know on a 365 day basis to be able to make it here and hopefully look their best on show day yeah excellent excellent pat we said we were going to talk a little bit about your genetics business why don't you tell us a little bit more about that yeah um we've always uh pushed the jack not only for our own herd but also uh you know selling uh, selling bulls for natural service selling semen selling embryos to uh, most of our neighbors, but now it's spread out to a little wider area. And so uh, we've always uh, done our own thing and, and uh, appreciated good cows and other people appreciating with them. And so we have a demand and we like to meet that demand, so. Yeah. Are there any synergies between your uh, Gen X business and your commercial business? Oh, definitely. I mean, the main thing is your, your number one goal is to increase the genetics in your herd for better production, better productive life, better health. And so that's the main, main goal, number one goal. Secondary goal is to meet meet the the needs of your market, you know uh, what they demand, what they would like, and part of it is breeding for show. Part of it is breeding for uh, high indexes and breeding for AI. So it's uh, but number one is for your own your own inside growth, inside yeah. improvement. Yeah. So I guess one question I'd have for all of you is um, what kind of changes have you seen in the animal phenotype over the years? And how's that changed? And then how do you see those changing going forward? And I'll just kind of step out. I'd like to see you guys have a discussion on that. I'll, I'll start out there. I mean, I, I really think that the show ring has embraced um, moderating stature over the past handful of years. And, you know, when I was younger and first getting into it, you know, they needed to be big. And um, they also needed to be good. But now they need to be good before they need to be big. And I really see that as a, as a positive change. And uh, in some cases, being too big can work against you in the show ring. And so uh, I think that's been, that's been really fun to see uh, that evolution. Yeah. You see that going forward as well, continuing? Or have we kind of, are we at where we need to be? Well, no. I mean, I think we'll continue to see that. And, and just because a cow is big doesn't mean they won't do well. But they, they need, definitely need to be balanced. And a balance is, is a word sometimes that gets overused. But... It's, it's pretty appropriate because if a cow doesn't have all the attributes we're looking for, and, and as Jim said, it's so competitive. They have to be on their A game, and they, and they have to be good pretty much everywhere, um, and that's what makes it exciting. So, mm -hmm. Gentlemen, you concur with those? Yeah, definitely. You know, we, we had this cow that was nominated All-American back in, like, 1967, and it was because she was a huge cow, but she was 61 and three-quarters inches. Now the two-year-olds are over 61 and three-quarters mm -hmm. inches. But because of her size, she was a low per milk producer, maybe 11, 12,000 of milk and a tough breeder. She was being a huge cow at that time. And so I think we did go, you know, too extreme is some, and, uh, and now we're, everybody's talking about balance and, you know, breeding, keeping it nice, mm -hmm. nice where they're at now, so. You know, I think for, for me, it's dairy strength has prevailed versus big and big bones and uh, dairy strength is a little one hard for a lot of people to see it in an animal uh, but when they have it uh, and they have balance uh, they will do well and it's something that we breed for uh, mammary systems in the industry have improved uh, dramatically and when you, you, I was in the Jersey show yesterday in the junior three-year-old class it was stunning the quality of, of udders in that show ring uh, from top to bottom. I, you just simply couldn't find one you wouldn't take home from a mammary system perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I know the Holstein show will be very much like that also. Mm -hmm. I had a question teed up for Brian because I know Brian's been a, uh, a, a judge here at World Day Expo before. And uh, what I wanted to know was, and, and I'll ask you guys the question, how do uh, the traits that you see in the cattle that you have in the show ring, how does that translate to your commercial herds? Well, I think Jim Starter had a good point, is the udders. I want, yeah. Number one thing on the dairies, we want good udders, and it's sure translated. You, you never see hardly any you know, bad udder in the herd anymore. You know? And same thing, feet and legs, udders, dairy strength, those are what you want in your milking herd. And uh, the same traits you know, that you, you're breeding for, for longevity, for health, and for uh, easy keeping. So. so you see it translating quite well then. Yes. Yeah. And, and Jonathan pointed out earlier that uh, we don't need massive cows. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we need, you know, 58 inch commercial cows that, that can move around really well. Um, they don't have to look like they're going to go off to World Dairy Expo to be a truly profitable, successful animal. Three lactations, four lactations, and an animal that's thriving all the way. Yeah. It, it's, uh, and, and that is one nice thing about genomics is that we're able to select uh, for so many traits that are beneficial that way. Yeah, I was going to dig into that later. Jonathan, I was wondering, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I'll just throw in there, uh, Jim mentioned genomics, but one of the things that gets me excited about the future is, um, you know, with the advent of genomics back in 2008, uh, these cows that are, are more commercial cows can really milk uh, at high levels as young two-year-olds get pregnant while doing it, stay in the herd, and uh, to be honest, some some past show cattle we struggled to get pregnant we you know maybe we struggled with some of those health traits and over time we're seeing where we started to be, be able to be successful with breeding some health traits into those pedigrees still have them be competitive at a very top level and uh, that's something that we strive for in our own breeding program because you know we want them to look good and we want them to compete but we also want them to have some of those same uh, genetic attributes that make other commercial cattle really successful and, and some of the best cattle today do that and we hope to continue to propagate those genetics. Yeah, that's a good point. I was wondering, is there any traits that you see in the, uh, your commercial herd that's consistent among some of your top producers that you think maybe needs to find its way into uh, the selection criteria for your show cattle? Yeah, so that's a good question. One of, one of the challenges is that we can, we've started to be able to make two-year-olds that consistently make you know, 120 pounds of milk um, at, at 90 days in milk and get pregnant while doing that. And that's, that's really something, that, I mean, it's, it's something to be celebrated. The, the challenge is that we need to have a little bit of style bred into those pedigrees, a little bit of flash and, you know, like silky thin hided, um, you know, a, a little bit of a, of a more dairy bone, not, not, and so some of those genomic pedigrees will give you those looks where they're, they're maybe not as silky and thin hided. They don't have that style, that general appearance, that show ring appearance that we're looking for. So. You know, we're trying to uh, kind of bring those two attributes together. Yeah. You know, one thing I was uh, thinking about as I was preparing for this is that uh, a show like this gives us an opportunity to interface with our consumers, right? And so I'm wondering if, is, is that something that you guys intentionally think about or are there ways that maybe we can leverage an event like this uh, right. Let's face it. Um, sometimes there's some false stuff out there that people are spreading around the, uh, to the consumers that's just simply uh, incorrect. What can we do or, or relative to, to shows like this or perhaps anything else to help uh, project the proper image for our industry or a correct image? I believe strongly that no matter where your station is in the dairy industry, whatever your role, we all have an obligation to do some communicating. And if you have 50 followers on a social media or 50,000, mm. we've all got to do it. Yeah. And we've got to tell our story. We have to communicate how how we care for our animals, how we nurture the land, how we care about things like animal care, animal health, um, soil erosion, yeah. sustainability, because, uh, you know, Cory Booker and AOC have an agenda, right. and that agenda could be devastating to the industry and to, quite frankly, consumers that consume high-quality dairy protein. Mm -hmm. And we have to stand up and we have to communicate. We have to do it in a productive manner. Uh, and occasionally we have to be aggressive uh, on the national stage uh, when some things are said about our industry that are not true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, that's something like you said, how often it's every day for us. Every employee I'm watching, how they're treating the animals, how they're caring for the animal. Cow comfort and care is like number one all day, 24 seven. And to have a, your, all the employees, you know, you, that's your main training, buy into it the whole time. And I think, like Jim said, we have a great story to tell. I think, yeah. you know, we're portrayed poorly and, and it's based more on size instead of, you know, actually how good a job we're taking care of the animals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I concur. I think we really need to make sure how much we care for our animals and our passion for, for the animals and the industry uh, comes across to the consumer and, and telling that story is really, really important. Yeah, I think passion's the word, right? I mean, every dairyman I've ever met has had a passion for the industry and for their animals. Um, Jim, just kind of build on something that you said, you know, no matter what we're doing, 
uh, on social media just kind of reminded me of something that we're doing here, not to toot our own horn, but I will just a little bit. We, we have something we call the Real Faces of Dairy. We have a Facebook page, and what we do is ask dairy farmers, dairy families to uh, put pictures out there showing the true face of dairy. And so I think somebody said we've got like 10,000 pictures out there. We've got 75,000 followers on that page. So, so for, for anybody listening to this, go to Real Faces of Dairy on Facebook and, uh, and follow us, please. If we can transition, maybe talking a little bit more about your commercial herd. Jonathan, why don't we uh, uh, swing over to you. Why don't you give us a little more background on your uh, commercial herd and what are some of the challenges you're dealing with today? Yeah, so um, a little bit about our commercial herd. We milk, as I said, in three facilities in New York, one in Ohio. Uh, we just recently put in a 72 cell um, Dairy Pro Q robotic rotary. Um, so that transitions to one of the challenges is, um, you know, not only getting qualified people to help, but uh, doing that in an economical manner. Um, and we're really, really lucky. We have a, a very qualified and dedicated and passionate team that work with us and and I always tell people that any successes we've enjoyed are really because of some of the team members we put together and any any anything that we've done that um, they really deserve all the credit for um, so so labor is always a challenge I think it's going to continue to be there though and and if people can't figure out a way to navigate that aren't going to be in the industry very long right because that's that challenge has always been there Environmental challenge, I think the same thing for us. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. One, one issue that uh, I think about college kids coming out of school now that have to deal with that at least my generation didn't is how, where are you going to market your milk? If, if you choose to be aggressive, if you choose to expand, um, you know, how you, you'd have to make sure you have a market for your milk. And in some cases, that can be really difficult. Uh, so at least in my area, I would say that's one of the, hot, the, the bigger challenges um, nowadays in terms of, again, if you were a, a young kid coming out looking to get a start in the dairy industry or to take your home farm and try to grow that, um, you really better, that's probably one of the first questions is, do you have a, a decent market for your milk? Yeah, that's a great point. Put a pin in that. I'm, I'm going to circle back on that just okay. a bit. Um, Jim, you talked about, uh, Jonathan brought up the importance of team during our discussions earlier. You had mentioned culture. Tell us a little bit about that and the importance of culture and the role that, that plays in your business. Well, about 15 years ago, John and Todd and myself, uh, our three partners, uh, looked at each other one day and said, we aren't making all the decisions anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had outgrown that. And we started focusing right then on culture. How can we build this organization and people committed to our values, our animal care values, our environmental values, our company's um, property on how we treat it. And, and if I summed up culture with one word, it's the word, of res it's the word respect. Mm -hmm. Respect for the land and respect for our, our community, respect for animals, and fundamentally respect for each other. Yeah. And our Absolutely. culture that we focus on is, are you investing in yourself every day a small amount mm -hmm. to improve. Mm -hmm. And over the course of a lifetime, you will be stunned with what you can accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know people, maybe from high school, that gave up, right? They stopped trying. They show up for work, but they stopped trying. Right. right? And we have people that are essentially entry-level workers 15 or 20 years ago, and now have risen where they're managing a team of 80 people and thriving. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's all about the culture of investing in yourself to learn more about what you're doing and learn how to lead people and organize work and, uh, and inspire people to do those things. Yeah, Jim, that's great advice. I appreciate that. Pat, uh, we are in a changing dairy uh, environment these days. Uh, dairies are getting bigger, and that presents a whole new set of opportunities and challenges. Um, give me some idea of how you guys are, are handling challenges today, but more importantly, what are some of the things you're planning for in the future? And what do you see some of the opportunities and challenges being? Yeah, I mean, as far as, uh, I mean, the challenges, especially in California now, is drought and forage quality and water. You know, everybody's talking about water, water and labor, you know. Uh, on labor, we're always trying to be like, you know, you try to build a good team, but you want to be the kind of place where workers want to come to, yeah. you know. And so, uh, and out there, it's not our issue yet because there's a lot of, uh, field workers that they're seasonal, but they were looking for something for 12 months a year, so we can pull from those. But 
you want to build that team, build that strength. But uh, so, I mean, uh, labor will be an issue, but um, one of the big challenges is uh, environmental regulations, permitting, and stuff like that. And so it's just, uh, uh, you know, just trying to survive and go through those regulations are, are a big issue. So those are the main issues is water, environment, and, and labor. Yeah, do you see any significant challenges to being able to, to, to continue operations in California? I know it's kind of a volatile situation sometimes out there with regulations and, and water and all of that. Do you see maybe moving that? I, yeah, I don't see it ever have, be having a sunset, you know. Yeah, yeah certainly it would be more difficult and operate, operating costs will go up because of it, but I don't ever see it being being phased out to that, yeah. to that extent. Yeah, so, okay. But. Very well. Jonathan, I uh, want to talk a little bit about dairy size. Is there an optimal size for a certain site? Um, you know, thoughts related yes, to that? Yes, as far as optimal size for a site, there's been a lot of talk over that over the years. I remember at one point in time it was 500 cows, and you were bringing in a full trailer load of, of feed and shipping out a full trailer load of milk, and then, you know, maybe that, that number has gone up. And, and uh, I think that the, the optimal size depends a lot on the area you're operating in. Uh, what environmentally you can do, how you can bring forages out in and bring and get manure out. Um, so I'm not sure there's an optimal size, and I think that you know we like to benchmark a lot and look at figures. And it's been it's been what from what I have seen is a lot of times the larger you are, you were able to drive costs out of out of the system. Now our area in the Northeast, you know, we would struggle with um, with dairies getting too big in terms of uh, bringing forages in and getting manure out. So that's what's limiting our size and, and being able to do that in a responsible manner. Yeah, so DMI has put forth that, that we want to be net, uh, zero net carbon neutral by 2050. What do you see maybe some challenges related to that and maybe what are some opportunities related to that? Well, it's certainly not anything that we can ignore yeah. um, because uh, you know it's here. And so um, we want to be part of the conversation, not necessarily react to it. So. It, it does feel like, at least in, in our operations, that's in the early stages, but we're having all those all those uh, discussions. Um, and again, I think as we move forward, just trying to be part of that conversation so that those regulations aren't kind of thrust upon us um, is, is our take. Yeah, yeah. Gentlemen, is any thought to the whole area of sustainability and what that means for the industry and how we interface with customers? Yeah, just the last couple of years, we've been putting a big investment in that side of it. Not only uh, solar that takes care of about 80% of my energy needs, but also putting in the methane digester that, you know, I think, uh, and be going forward, that might be our main cash flow the next, you know, in 10, 15 years is maybe from the, you know, green, uh, using the methane and greenhouse gases and uh, biosolids. And there's uh, definitely opportunity there for, you know, to diversify another diversification of the dairy and that being an income stream instead of a negative. Yeah. You know, you know I've got a, a concern about, uh, you know, the calculation on how neutral, uh, yeah. carbon neutral is calculated. And I, I'm, the biggest concern I have is that many producers, uh, and I'm one of them, have outsourced the digesters mm -hmm. on, a, on two of our enterprises. So somebody else is getting that carbon credit. They own it. Now we get a royalty. It's probably not as lucrative as if it would have been if we invested the money. Um, but I, what I'd want to push for is if you have a digester on your farm for net neutral, zero carbon, it should be able to be counted. If not, it's going to force a whole bunch of producers into an industry that they may not be ready for. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, dairy cow, dairy farms, crop farming, it's a, they're, they're all very specific levels of expertise that's required and a digester is another level or another area of expertise that would be required not every organization should be or could be successful in that arena okay so on a farm we could we should have digesters but we may we may need to be able to count that carbon uh, improvement going forward yeah now is there an optimal size or or mass um, to have in, a, in an area to be able to justify digesters well, I think there's absolutely a, a, a size or, or scale that's required, and I think it's changing with technology. Um, I think the biggest challenge the industry is having is there's a bit of a gold rush going on in digesters, yeah. and the biggest deals are happening because there's the, they're probably the most lucrative, and some of the medium-sized ones are, 
while there's deals signed, they're not breaking ground, or if they broke ground, they're kind of sitting. And there's some problems with the capacity yeah. to build all those. <clears throat> yeah, I've seen some areas in California where they're taking uh, dairy areas where they're clustering the dairies and they're piping them so they can use put the three or four dairies together to uh, maximize it and make it more efficient uh, for that reason, so. Yeah. So, gentlemen, I'm sure you've seen, your, your dairies have grown a lot. You've gone from single-site dairies, smaller dairies, now your multi-site dairies. What are some of the, uh, the, the challenges with decision-making that has, has come with that? Right, there was at one point in time, you guys were making all the decisions. You were the janitor, you were the, you know, everything. And now, um, you've got people uh, managing different aspects of the business. How do you operate as a CEO? For me, it's about uh, empowerment and engagement. And if the people that are making those decisions are highly engaged, generally speaking, they're going to make the right decision. I have a very strict rule, and that is we have to allow for mistakes, but we cannot allow sloppy management. We cannot tolerate it. And there's a very distinct difference, and sometimes you have to point them out to people. Yeah. Um, a mistake is a piece of equipment hitting a gate. It's a mistake. A uh, piece of equipment hitting a gate all the time is sloppy. And it, it really is that fundamental. And if, they're making, if they care a lot, if people care a lot, they'll make good decisions. The, the other thing that's occurred to me is we're in this battle of non -feed, or getting our non-feed costs really, truly minimized. And we're chasing pennies now, uh, looking for a lower cost business model. And so around that is purchasing. I, I used to make every purchasing, or most purchasing decisions. You know, right. What's the price per ton? What are you paying for several different items? And how does it pencil out? Uh, and now there's so many other people making those decisions. Yeah. And we need them to care a lot. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Jonathan, what level of decision do you like to be involved with? And then at what point do you decide that you're going to uh, give that to somebody else? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we try to stay pretty high level, except on, on two of the dairies, my brother and I manage, you know, kind of the day-to-day -day operations for the most part. And then the other dairies, we hire your managers. And uh, the, the two words that I thought of that uh, Jim had already said are, are empowerment and mistakes. Um, so they, they need to be empowered to make those decisions. And we don't, uh, we don't really have across farm protocols, whether it be for OVSYNC protocols or vaccination protocols, we empower the managers to make those decisions. And we have to allow them to make mistakes, but we also are gonna grade them based on results. And so, uh, if they're not hitting some targets that we're happy with, then we're going to have a discussion about that. And uh, at times, you might have to make some changes, right? And so if, 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 that, if whether it's a manager or an employee can figure out a way not to be sloppy, to use Jim, Jim's word, then you either need to guide them or coach them back uh, so they see that, uh, or else eventually, you know, that could lead to turnover. Yeah, good comments. Gentlemen, we've got our co-host has just arrived, fresh from the show ring. <laughs> Mr. Brian Garrison, welcome. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> we, we were hoping for a, a purple one up here. No, the best I could do was eight this time. Okay. Yeah, it eight happens. this time. Well, that was the question we were going to ask. Was it the, was it the cow or the uh, the, the person leading? It, it? was the lead. Uh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Brian, you missed a great discussion so far, but glad to have you here. Well, thanks for you guys <laughs> being part of this. So Pat, can you talk a little bit about, uh, we were talking about internal employees and, and, and how we make decisions and when we delegate. Um, what kind of outside resources do you employ? You know, not many, we're, we're large enough as a company, we do have a human resources manager that takes a load off of the managers and stuff. And he's, but he's covering four different companies, 250 employees, so we're able to do that. And then he resources out when he needs help, and so that's a, between my uh, sisters, our CFO, and he's the human resources that that really takes a load off of us as a you know on the low level. So yeah, do you but, have internal uh, veterinarians and nutritionists, or do you are you outsourcing uh, those services? Yeah, we outsource uh, nutritionists, but we do have our internal veterinarians because of with the embryos and preg checking, and, and we have all everything else is internal. So yeah. but we yeah nutritionists is outsourced. Yeah. yeah, so in our business, we deal a lot with nutritionists. How, what, what criteria goes into selecting a good nutritionist? I mean, well, it's not only knowledge, but it's, it's got to be somebody that you have the same uh, mindset with, you know, have the same ideal and you yeah. get along with, because you got to work with them, work with them on a lot of things. And so it's, uh, 
you know, it's uh, a variety of things, but it's, you know, you gotta like to have somebody that's uh, well connected and is not only up to date with the new technology, but is well grounded and, but you gotta get along with them and have the same mindset, same ideas. Yeah. Jim, same question for you. What criteria do you use when selecting a nutritionist? Well, so you're, you, out, you're outside of my pay grade here. All right, okay? got it. <laughs> I, I'm on the other side of the wall. I'm on the business side, but I can tell you how we operate. Yep. And the, uh, we have people, uh, John Vosters on, on the livestock side, business partner, and uh, a, a gentleman named Eric Onan, and th they are very laser focused. Uh, one thing I will say is we have seen some, we brought some new nutritionalists in to different facilities and that brought some new perspectives, and I think it's been a, a net gain for us. Uh, better components, better milk price. It's pretty hard to gauge how we're doing on feed costs in a rising feed environment relative to, you know, let, let's call it the, the control scenario. Yeah. Uh, but in general, I think we're, we're ahead. Okay, good. By making some changes. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I agree. They have to share your culture. A nutritionist has to share your culture. They have to be able to challenge us. They have to be able to tell us when they think we're doing something wrong or we could be better in an area. And they need to bring fresh ideas and perspectives to us. Um, they need to be well respected in the industry so that they have those connections where they pick up on things. They need to be astute enough to, to learn what could be valuable to us and, and bring it to us. And, and obviously they, I mean, to start out with, they need to be professional. We have we have meetings, and, and a lot of times we'll ask them to run a nutritional meeting, and uh, they need to be bring things to us that we find of value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great comments, guys. Uh, one thing I kind of wanted to dig into was animal welfare, and you know it's very important to our consumer. I think it's a problem. I think it's something we have to manage around. I kind of like to get your perspectives, and Jonathan, I'll, I'll start with you. How do you manage? Uh, animal welfare on your at your facilities. Well, I mean, you have to establish that culture that, yeah. that we care about our animals, and, and and that culture trickles down. And once everybody realizes that, um, I can't say that we necessarily have to let people go, but they, they they will know that that is certainly out there, and that is one of the few things that you can be caught doing one time and be let go on the spot. There's yeah. not many things uh, that we won't let people go without warnings and and without behavior correction. Uh, but there's zero tolerance for uh, misbehavior with animals. And so once that culture is set and everybody understands that, um, we typically don't see it as, as an issue. And, and you know, nowadays there's cameras in areas and, and once again, once you set that culture, if somebody witnesses something that they don't think is right, they'll come to you and, and if it's caught on a camera, you can see it. If not, you know, it ends up being one person's word against another person's word, but you just go and have a conversation with that person and say, listen, if we catch you doing something like this again, you know, there's, there's going to be no room for, for, for discussion. You're going to be dismissed. And we have those same conversations with our managers. And for us, once that culture is set, hopefully it's not, not going to be an ongoing issue. Yeah, yeah, great comments. Um, and, and echo some I heard from Jim earlier. So. I think, I think you can, uh, as best you can, manage animal welfare from your own personal employee's perspective, but how do you safeguard against sabotage from outside entities? And I think we've had that happen before, right? You know, for me, it, it's, it's really about the culture of the team. Yeah. So I, I think about this very often, and I think our organization needs to talk about it all the time. And we have to have a culture that's so strong that they would overwhelm a bad actor somebody that is either really frustrated at two in the morning or somebody that maybe came to the farm with ill intent. And if our culture is strong enough, we should be able to force that behavior out of the organization. And that's what, that's what I stay focused on. Yeah. Pat, any thoughts on that you'd like to share? Yeah, it's saying like I mentioned earlier, just an everyday thing, every employee thing. And like John said, you know you're putting it across right if you have some coming to you telling us, hey, I'm not sure this guy is treating animals nice. And you know you have that culture down through everybody and if they're concerned then you know then you're on you know you're on the right path you know yeah. as far as for cow treatment and cow care but it goes beyond that too is hey you know it gets hot and make sure their cows are in the shade plenty of water you know and and feed and quality feed and anyway so it goes beyond you know that too so just make sure everybody knows hey every animal counts and we care about everyone so yeah yeah Great input, guys. I'm going to ask you now to bring out your uh, crystal balls, kind of look into the future. What does the next uh, one to two decades look like for 
your farms. Jonathan, you want to start? Yeah, so I mean, for, for the way that, that we operate, um, I, I mentioned we just put a new, new parlor in. I've got uh, young children at home, uh, five and seven years old. So uh, we're not necessarily looking to expand unless something makes sense for our business. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. You know, we, we um, monitor our financial numbers close enough that we need to make sure we're staying competitive. And uh, uh, we have expanded over the years, but it needs to make business sense for us personally. And maybe uh, our family's life goals are, are at a point where we're going to uh, slow down and enjoy our family a little bit, which might seem funny to some after just going through an expansion. But, uh, you know, I really enjoy being around cows. I enjoy putting my boots on, getting a little manure on my clothes sometimes and or all the time, really. And so um, that's an aspect that I don't want to lose because that's, that's part of what, what I really enjoy. Mm. Thanks for that. Gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like John, we didn't, we uh, just recently uh, we're re going through remodel, putting in new parlors, new equipment, with the same that focus the next two decades, and uh, but so not only new clean equipment, but also better uh, more cow comfort for the cows. They're cool, cool areas, and uh, but also uh, you know everything's set up so we can be also be. Uh, environmentally friendly and everything's going to be you know can be carbon neutral mm -hmm. and and so not only be a a, a a way on the on the business but you know be it a, a benefit so that's what we're everything we're gearing toward is is for cow comfort and uh environmentally friendly and and that's our plan for the next 20 years so mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on that i think about the future a lot um, i see our consolidation of our industry occurring at an increasing rate and that to me screams, get ready for narrow margins, sometimes inverted, sometimes absolutely brutal for long periods of time. And so our organization, we're focused on getting leverage low. Interest rates, in my opinion, are going up. So leverage and interest rates and uh, compressing margins is an intersection that nobody needs wants to be at. Uh, the other thing, back to our business, is I challenge our leadership team uh, to focus on what changes we need to make today to be better tomorrow. Uh, we're at war against our non-feed costs. How can we get a penny out of it or 10 cents out of it? And I also uh, tell the team regularly that our future is laughing at us. Mm. They're laughing at the way we're doing things mm. today, and I know that because we laugh at the way we did things right. years ago. Yeah. And we've got to get on with getting to that future state, that, that the way we're going to be uh, operating our dairies uh, faster. Yeah. With these three gentlemen, we're here at the show. They're active in, in that aspect, and I'm sure you've already covered that in our podcast today. But they've also got their, their dairy business. But in each one of those, in each in their own way, they've supported a lot of youth. They've had different programs. Jim, Pat, and Jonathan have had programs at their farms. They've had incentives at sales that they've had that encourage new people to get involved in showing cows. And myself, I didn't grow up on a dairy. I started showing cows, but it's become my livelihood. <laughs> and so I think each one of these guys has affected the future. And I get a little bit passionate about it, but, but they have reached out to a lot of young folks and I think have influenced a lot of new people to our industry. So thanks for that, guys. Yeah, nice comment, Brian. Um, Brian, you've spent quite a bit of your career in the genetics business. Uh, so as you look into your crystal ball, um, what's going to become of the primary breeds, if anything, right? Are we going to evolve toward what the poultry industry and the swine industry have done? What's your crystal ball look like? I think, I think there's, maybe to echo Jim's uh, comments about some consolidation, I think, you know, in terms of the breeds and, and the future of some of those breeds and how, especially in terms of identified cattle, I think there's going to be more of that consolidation. I think, you know, the technology in terms of genomics and those things have helped to identify some of the positives for different breeds. You start talking about A2, A2 milk and, you know, some you know, different caseins and milk and, you know, a lot of those things, you, you know, technology has helped us to identify some of those. And I think some of the different breeds are, are looking to how they can best take advantage of those. Uh, and I think so, I think it's important for us as an industry to, you know, to keep an open mind to some of those things and how we can best utilize those in the future. Yeah. Mm, good comments. Uh, Jim, going to 
ask you, you talked a little bit before about your, uh, your, your small boutique cheese business. What role do you see integration, both backward and forward integration, playing uh, in the evolution of the dairy industry in the next one to two decades? Well, I've spent most of my career trying to be integrated. <laughs> yeah. And I'm still trying. Okay. Uh, we're in, in boutique branded cheese. It is very difficult to succeed in. Uh, and I've been in it for seven years. In the last 36 months is the first time I felt like I was qualified to be there. And it is difficult. It, it is, uh, it's a set of knowledge and skill that is different than the skill and knowledge that we have from milking cows. And to be two things that are truly great at is really not, it's a unicorn, it really doesn't exist. And so you have to have some fundamental advantages in what you're doing. Uh, scale matters. And in boutique cheese, you just can't sell enough of it unless you've got something that you can scale out uh, to, to absorb your overhead. So I, I, I'm a little more pessimistic about integration than I was 15, 20 years ago. On the other side, I think there's some incredible um, integration that's occurred in, in, uh, in the example of Select Milk and what they did with Fair Life. Um, now, they've sold it, but they have some uh, production contracts uh, but they pulled off an, a miracle, really. It, it's it's incredible what they did uh, by developing this great brand. And, you know, I, we were a member of Select, and we felt like we were owners of that integration. And uh, I encourage the bigger organizations to really look to innovation so that they can come up with some products, uh, some innovation in our industry so they can carve out some value for producers. And, they, and Select Milk did that terrifically. Yeah. That's an excellent comment. Pat, do you, what, what role do you see innovation playing in the future of the dairy industry? Yeah, on all aspects. I mean, it's, it's going to be uh, not only on the embryo transfer and all that, and our genetics and all that, but uh, certainly on the, the breed side. And, and that is how we're going to use like the, the bioenergy and the methane, biosolids, all those uses for that. I know as far as dairy product side, we belong to a co-op, but they're trying to be on the front edge too. They're recently putting in, they're going to put in a UHT plant, so we're a, more of a butter powder type co-op, but all types of powders, mixes, and so that powder uh, aspect goes in all different things, and uh, you know, trying to get, uh, trying to feed the world. So I mean, they're exporting powder all over the world in all different forms and all different types, and so, but. All right, as we're kind of getting uh, to the close here and kind of wanting to wrap up, kind of like to get you guys' view, what does the uh, future dairy look like? 2050, what does that dairy look like? What size is it? Where is it located? Is it located in the United States? Is it located, you know, in China? Um, you know, what's the technology look like? I know that's a big question, but I'll let you guys just kind of riff with that. Jonathan, you'd like to start with that? Yeah. I maybe, mean, I, maybe we should have brought, thrown that to Brian, right, the newcomer, but uh, Jonathan, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, again, more of the same, right? Um, they're going to get bigger and they're going to continue to consolidate. They're going to be in, in areas of the country um, that's not as prone to environmental challenges, maybe doesn't have a land pressure, um, that type of thing. I, you, you asked if, it, if we're going to be bringing milk in from China or foreign entities. I think um, from a food safety standpoint, boy, I, I, if, if our politicians let that happen, it's, it's a major, major failure. I mean, we really need to keep that food uh, production domestic because uh, you know when that pandemic hit you know what what you know it was bread toilet paper and milk and 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 those essential items I, I mean it kind of really reinforced how important we are in in what we do so um, you know you can travel around the country and you can see where dairies are really rapidly expanding in, into mega dairies and in in some cases it's for me it's a little bit sad to see because you know, the, the kind of the mom and pop dairies are going away a little bit, but that's, you know, hey, that's just the way it is and that's the way it's been. Um, and there's gonna be more of that in the future. And where I am, there'll still be dairies, uh, but as we've seen milk traveling and milk products traveling, they a lot of times they're gonna get uh, produced in areas of the country uh, where it's a little bit easier to do that from an environmental standpoint you know, a price of land standpoint, uh, bringing, bringing feed in and, and shipping milk out. Yeah. Brian, anything to add to that? No, I think Jonathan, I mean, summed it up pretty, pretty well. You yeah. know, you know, the, the scale is going to be a part of it. 
these three are, are somewhat unique in that they have been able to build internal businesses within. I think there's still going to be a place for that. You know, the genetics business, you know, different, you know, cheese, you know, different types of things uh, that they've all three been successful at. But I, I, I see kind of that combination continue on a bigger scale, actually. Yep. Good comments. Anything to add, gentlemen? Uh, for me, it, it, the, the future is going to uh, be owned by the people with the lowest cost of production. And uh, there are massive organizations that are taking shape. They're going to have the lowest cost of production. They're doing it in places where they can get massive scale. And I, I think that most people would assume that I'm a proponent of scale, and I am uh, just to get costs down. But there are some diseconomies of scale uh, that go on with our size. Uh, so a big feed area has some diseconomies of scale. The payloader's got to drive further, right? Well, a bigger organization has the same types of diseconomies of scale, and that is a fairly elaborate accounting department. Right? Mom's not doing the books anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm a dist economy of scale. I'm not out doing the work, right? We're, I'm, we're hiring somebody to do that, and I'm, yeah. I'm working on other things. And so the, the organizations, the fi family farms that are going to be uh, successful in the future are going to have that very low cost advantage. No matter what they're doing, they better be low cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sort of agree. It's got to be big enough to be efficient, but. I think there's a limit too. You can see that some of the cows, as far as as far as distance, the cow has to travel to get milked. And so I see, even though an operation can be big, but it might have you know different pods in, in an operation. Even though you know, like you said, a feed area can be more efficient, or the office or the management. But as far as how far the cow comfort and how far they got to walk and you know how far they can handle it, I think there's there are limits. And so I think something in that two to three thousand. Depends how they're housed as far as how far they got to walk makes a difference. So, yeah. yeah, thank you for that, Pat. Gentlemen, um, anything that we've missed that you think the audience needs to know and needs to hear about from you guys today? Well, just along that those those same comments is that you know if I look and, and compare our operation uh, from 20 and 30 years ago, I would say we you know we kind of were probably more low what I would call low input low output. So right now those like really really large dairies out in the west. A lot of times I see them being low input, low, low output, and uh, we in the Northeast have had to transition to being able to be more efficient by getting high output from our from our cows, and and that part of that's why I'm passionate about genetics, and and um, and in particular Holsteins because we've been able to breed those kinds of cows that can make a lot of solids uh, per cow per day. So in the future, I think those guys that have started out by driving costs out by being efficient. They're gonna in 50 years. They're gonna need to be able to transition to be continue to be uh, low cost, but figure out a way to be high output at the same time. Yeah, great comments, gentlemen. That's gonna be last call. I'm gonna ask you to give uh, a couple pieces of advice for new young dairy farmers just coming into the business, the next generation. And Brian, I'm gonna start with you. Don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> you know, go up to the Jonathan Lambs, the Pat Maddoxes, the Jim Ostroms of the world. And, and you know, don't be afraid to ask questions because there's guys like them that are out there that are willing to share, you know, just like they have today, share their ideas, their inputs, and don't be afraid to get different opinions on things and, and drive on. Yeah, good, excellent. There's a lot of opportunity for young people in this in this business that, that have the interest and the passion and, and the ability to learn from their mistakes, and so uh, I still I still think that that those types of people uh, there's a lot of roles for them in the future, and and um, you know I would encourage those people again ask ask those questions get better uh, learn but then don't lose your passion you know the day you lose your passion it's time to do something different yeah well said yeah that's why I tell young people I said really I'm still learning you never stop learning. You talk, you discuss, uh, even sit downs like this. You never stop learning, no matter how old you are. You, you know, whether it's through the, you know, media or meetings or in person. And uh, and I tell everybody, I'm from being from California, I said, come to World Dairy Expo. This is the Super Bowl of dairy. Mm -hmm. You see so much here. You can learn so much here. And no matter where you're at, if the dairy industry or not, they come here and they're always fascinated. And so I always tell people, tell everybody to come. It's yeah. a great event. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I, I reach out to, uh, let's say, early teens and tell them what a great industry this is uh, because I think it really has a great future. 
we're not going to make water bottles. How boring could that be, right? Mm -hmm. But we are working with great animals that are dynamic and uh, who doesn't love a cow? I mean, yeah. they're just terrific. But on the other hand, um, I think we have to look at the younger people coming in our industry and we have, to, we have to make sure they're engaged so they don't pick a different business. I was, silly story, but I was at a county fair where the county fair rules were overwhelming a young lady and they wanted to send her home because she had some ringworm on an animal and they wanted to send her home, mm. right? And I thought, you know, maybe she's gonna pick dance mm. and not dairy cows. You know, we've got to think about those things when we're talking with young people about how we can get them really engaged and enthused about our, our business. And that's what I, back to World Dairy Expo, what I love is all the young people, the, the, uh, the Holstein Junior Show and the kids out in there, they are falling in love with this business. Yeah. And many of them will be our leaders. And someday, some kid out there that may be 12 or 13, we might be working for him someday <laughs> or her. Yeah, Probably absolutely. her. Absolutely. Without a doubt, uh, yeah. Our universities, there's far more females in, uh, in, in dairy science than there are males today. Gentlemen, this has been excellent. I have absolutely enjoyed this, uh, exceeded expectations. I've had a lot of fun, so I want to thank you for that. Also, I want to thank our loyal listeners, and I, I hope you had as much fun as I've had. I hope you've learned something. As a reminder, I want to tell you guys that um, recently we had a series of webinars on the new dairy NRC. We're going to be having those in podcast form. So go to balkim.com slash real science to go out there and uh, see the new podcast when they arrive and also take a look at the past the webinars. You can receive a 25% discount on the new Dairy NRC if you go to balkim.com slash real science. Click on the uh, Dairy NRC. If you like what you heard, please remember to hit the five-star rating on your way out. Don't forget to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt. You just need to like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Folks, really uh, glad having you here today and look forward to seeing you here next time at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends.